Good morning. I enjoy when a pastor asks me to fill the pulpit. Little did I know that when I first touched base with him that they were going to be gone on the missions trip to Haiti. So it is a real joy and privilege to be here, and I just want to share something personally before we get too far into the message. Nancy, would you please stand? Many of you don't know, but Nancy grew up in this church. I'm a transplant. Thank you, sweetheart. Today marks a very special day for Nancy and I, especially as it deals with this church, for it was 30 years ago today that you as a congregation commissioned Nancy and I to be Awana missionaries, and I wanted to take an opportunity before the message to let you know how much we appreciate all that you have done for us and given us the opportunity to serve so many churches and individuals over the year. We were thinking about how many churches have we had an, an opportunity to touch in the past 30 years, and we think it's somewhere north of 1,500 churches, let alone individuals and pastors and ministering to them and their leadership through the Awana ministry. But Nance and I wanted to make sure that I took time today to share with you from our heart, from our deepest appreciation, all your prayers, all your encouragement, all the opportunities to give us to serve the Lord and for your faithful giving to our ministry. How many more years we have serving the Lord as Awana missionaries? I do not know, but I do know one thing. When Art Roheim, the gentleman that started Awana, was 85 years of age, he was asked by somebody at headquarters, Art, when are you going to retire? He looked at him and says, retire? Yeah, when are you going to retire? He said, I retire every evening when I go to bed and wake up every morning to re-enlist in the service of my Savior. And so we pray the same thing for us. However the Lord leads us in the future, however many more years he gives us as Awana missionaries, we thank the Lord for the privilege of serving the Lord in this way. And we just wanted to personally thank you how much we appreciate our home church over the years, especially as we've looked in my first experience was when I was 18 after graduating from high school and moving from Ohio over here for the summer and ended up staying, I began to notice that there was a real heartbeat for missions on the part of this church. Nancy and her family lived just around the corner from the old riverside, and there were missionaries who would come and speak at the church, and Nancy have told, told me time and time again, they would have missionaries and speakers over to their house. It was an opportunity for them to be able to have needs met by providing a meal. But Nancy told me, she said, my heartbeat for missions was when I sat across and talked to and interacted with missionaries who are currently serving. So I look at the back of our bulletin and I'm reminding about what's in our bulletin. Currently our church is involved in a Haiti missions trip as they serve down there ministering to those folk there in great need. I also look at the two missionaries that our church is uh, recognizing and encouraging us to pray for. That's John and Susan Briggs in Togo, West Africa, and Anna Beth Wivel serving in Chad. The one thing that we can come to a conclusion about our church over the years, and it's as obvious as a nose on our face, is that this church has a heartbeat for missions, not only locally, but around the world. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we begin to look at the Word of God this morning? Heavenly Father, I am thankful for my home church and for their heartbeat for missions and the evidence that is seen by our missions trip now underway in Haiti, supporting missionaries around the world, Togo, Chad, and other corners of the world, across America, and Lord, right here in central and southern Illinois, Lord, thank you for giving us a heartbeat for missions. And Lord, a church can be measured by their love for the things of the Lord, by how big their love is for missions, both locally and around the world. I thank you for our home church, for all they have done and will continue to do for us in our ministry as we are representing them throughout this area of the state. Now, Lord, as we look at your word, I ask that you would take the word by your spirit and teach us, encourage us, motivate us, move us. And Lord, where we need to be lovingly spanked by your gracious hand, do so that we would be more like Jesus than we were when we came in. 
Thank you again for this time around the word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take your Bibles, however you have it. You may have it electronically. You may have it hardback. I don't know what version you use, but I encourage you to jot down a few, a few thoughts as we go through. Turn with me, if you would be, would, to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. The title of this morning's message is How to Be Successful in a World That is Failing. As Nancy and I ramped up for this coming summer, celebrating 30 years, marked by today being the day, we began asking the Lord, Lord, if we have an opportunity to share the word with our churches, what do you want us to share and to be able to pour our hearts into? The Lord directed me to share this, and we are sharing it as much as we have opportunity throughout the summer as I have opportunity to fill the pulpit or talk with leadership. But how are we to be successful in a world that is failing? And you would agree with me that this world is a mess. It is failing on every corner and every avenue. But how do we measure success as believers? The world sometimes uses the measure of success by looking at how much power an individual can obtain. How much can they be in control? Some measure success in this world by what they can possess. If I have another one of these, or if I can just put something else in my garage, or if I can just add to this. And so they measure success by how much they can possess. Some in our world measure success by how much prestige and how much recognition they can get either by a position or a title. In this world, some even measure success by the profession they go into. As we as believers walk in this world and seek to serve the Lord and walk in obedience to his word, how does the word of God remind us that we should measure success? The Apostle Paul was building tents. Why was he building tents back in the, Old, in the New Testament book of Acts? He built it because I heard one commentary say he built those so he could serve the Lord through the local ministries. So however the Lord has led and directed you, and wherever you are in your life, how do we measure success from a biblical standpoint? The first true measure of success begins on a spiritual level. When we come to that point in our lives, when we put our personal faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, when we realize that the word of God is accurate when it says, for we are all sinners. We're sinners because of our very nature and our very actions. We are separated from a holy and righteous, loving God. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of our need for the Savior and we come to the Lord and call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that is where the beginning of true success lies. It begins at the foot of Calvary. But turn with me, if you would please, to the book of Joshua. I'd like to share with you four principles, and you may have heard them before, but these are familiar passages. How do we measure success in a world that is failing? In the book of Joshua, we pick it up in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, and said. Now, put it in context. When we read in the Old Testament, we read that in Genesis, that Joseph went and was taken and thrown into a pit and sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. God blessed the children of Israel in Egypt. Then there came a Pharaoh that did not know or remember the story of Joseph and how God used him in a mighty way in that pagan land. And so at that time in Egypt, the Jews became slaves, manual labor, and were outcast in the society. God delivered his people. Moses was raised up to deliver them from the bondage of slavery. They crossed into, through the Red Sea, and they were beginning the wilderness journey to the promised land. Some Bible scholars say it would only take a few days or a few weeks for the children of Israel to get to their promised land, but because of a lack of faith 
and a lack of following the leading of the Lord, God said you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Then they came to just beyond the promised land. God says, Joshua, you are now going to assume the leadership. They were about ready here in chapter 1 to enter into the promised land, to possess what God has said he's going to give them. And here is the word from the Lord spoken by Joshua to the people, beginning in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Now jump over to verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous and observe and do all according to the law. Now verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night and observe to do all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. I've written in the margin of my Bible a definition for good success in verse 8 is this, that then you shall be made prosperous, and then you shall have Good success, which is only measured by a walk of spiritual consistency. For that is true success as believers. When we walk in spiritual consistency. Notice verse 8 again. The instructions, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. We are to speak the word. And you shall meditate there day and night. We shall be thinking the word that you may do and observe all that is written therein. So how do we measure success in a world that is failing? Verse 8 says we need to think the word, speak the word, and do the word. The principle here I'd like to leave with you is the first of many points, but we're only going to look at four this morning. How do we measure success in a world that is failing? Get into the word and let the word get into you. Get into the word and let the word get into you. Not only absorb it with your mind and understanding, but be yielding to it so the Spirit of God can take the word of God and change your heart that leads to a change in your actions and your activity. How do we measure success? In a world that is failing, get into the word and let the word get into you. Now that can happen many ways. Reading through the Bible, taking time in Sunday school, your own personal devotions, family devotions, listening to good Christian music, which is really the doctrines put to rhythm and sound. Be exposed to the word. Think it when you converse and be willing to do it as God leads and directs. But I want you to note this reference. Judges chapter 2, verse 10. The book of Joshua is about the children of Israel possessing the land. God's mighty works as he leads his people to conquer and possess the land that the Lord promised. But we come to Judges, which is at the end of the book of Joshua, and we read this. And also all that generation that were, that were gathered to their fathers, following those who were part of possessing the land, there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor the works which he had done in Israel. The difference between the book of Joshua and now in the book of Judges is the fact that the children who were descendants of those who possessed the land did not follow Joshua 1.8. They did not think it, they did not speak it, they did not share it, and they did not live it. The challenge for us today is get into the word and let the word get into you. Let the word of God be at home in your heart. Second of all, how do we be successful in a world that is failing? Turn with me, if you would, please, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We read in John 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, when he was going to go to the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection to provide salvation for all who would believe, that he should depart from this world to his Father, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them into the end. Then beginning in verse 2, the Passover meal. 
where the Lord established communion that we observe today to remember the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Then we read down in verse 5, or verse 4. He arose from supper, he laid aside his garments, took a towel, and wrapped it around himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. I have yet to see a piece of Facebook that shows everybody's bare feet. There is nothing as repulsive as bare feet. You do not want to see a picture of my feet, and I surely don't want to see a picture of your feet. There are jokes that have been made, everything from toe jam and all, all this, but we're talking about probably the hideous part of the human body and put ourselves back in that day and age. Many wore sandals when they would come into a house with all the travels to and fro, their feet would be the dirtiest part and probably the only dirty part of their body. So the servants or the lowly slaves would be the ones that would wipe and clean the feet so they could stay in and enter into the house. Jesus uses this opportunity just before he goes to Calvary to teach a very important truth of what success for you and I as believers is all about. He began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now if you jump with me over to verse 12 of John chapter 13. So after he had washed their feet, and he had taken his garments and was seated again, he said to them, do you know what I've just done? You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and master, wash your feet, you also shall wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do it as I have done. Truly I say to you, in verse 16, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than him that sent him. If you do these things, happy or supremely blessed you are. So what's the principle of Jesus teaching his disciples? That we all should wash everyone's feet? Notice it says, as an example, to where the Lord's table and baptism is a ordinance. The example here is, have a servant's heart. Be willing to do the menial, that which is not popular or that which is not public and that which isn't given a lot of self-esteem. The lowliest and the most humble of servants wash feet. We stand no taller in the eyes of the Lord than we take on the form of a servant. Recently, I read across the following information that Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of America who helped to draft the Declaration of Independence, as a young man wanted to write a list of 12 virtues that he would use to model his maturing process into an older man to be able to contribute to life. One of his friends saw the list and said, uh, you may want to add the characteristic or the virtue of humility. In that paragraph in Ben Franklin's writing, his example that he used of true humility was from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself, consider equality with God, something to be used for his own advantage, but rather made himself a servant and taking on the very nature of a servant. Do we want to be successful in a world that is failing? Get into the word and let the word get into us. Second of all, have a servant's heart. Jesus also taught the very same truth, not only from John 13, but when he spoke to the disciples about, you want to be great, become a servant to others. Thirdly, if you would please turn with me back to John chapter 6. How to be successful in a world that is failing. Get into the word and let the word get into you. Have a servant's heart. 
And then we come to John chapter 6, and one of these so familiar stories from when we were children learning them in Sunday school. Jesus lays it out before us. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is called the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he had done for those who were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was drawing near. Then verse 5. When Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great multitude coming to him. And he said to Philip, one of his disciples, where are we going to get the money to feed all these people? My loose paraphrase. As we continue reading through the passage, Jesus uses this opportunity to teach a lot of lessons to his disciples. But we come down to verse 9. Simon Peter says, uh, there's a young boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But how can that be sufficient for so many? Well, we know the account that Jesus blesses and multi multiplies the food and feeds the multitude there. Some saying a crowd that could approach 20,000 people. When we read a simple passage like this, I'm reminded of that little boy with his lunch or his fish and bread, and uh, Scripture doesn't record his name, but it speaks volumes. Truth number three, how to be successful in a world that is failing? We need to do what we can. We need to do what we can. I'm also reminded about 2 Kings chapter 5, the little slave girl that told her mistress, uh, tell your husband to go to the prophet, for he can heal him. And we know Naaman the leper was healed. Principle number three, do what you can to make a difference. Some say, well, I can't teach. Some say, well, I don't have a lot of talent, or I don't know how this or, or that. God does not measure by our talents, but God measures by his giftedness in our lives. There's one thing that I'm overwhelmed with as Nancy and I continue our ministry. One of the most effective tools in society today is a personal handwritten note. No more than three sentences long carries weight. Let me give you one example. One of the age groups of the club ministry we work with in Awana is called Sparks. And those of you who work through with Sparks, you know they are full of energy. I mean, it's like I've got to tie them down when they walk in the door because they'll be on the ceiling in a matter of minutes. They are full of energy and are sincere and simple in their approach to the things of the Lord. Part of a handbook encourages a sparky clubber, kindergarten, first or second grade, I think it's a second grader, to write a missionary that that local church supports. Well, we get a lot of those letters a couple of years ago, and Nancy does the writing because of two things. Her penmanship is legible. And second of all, that's a ministry that she loves to take on. So we always send back a letter, handwritten note, to the Sparky. So we were at a church a couple of years ago and walked in the door for a morning service. I think it was uh, Pulpit Supply. And here come a mom with a, a third grader coming up the aisle. Came to Nancy and I says, I just want you to meet my daughter. He said, you probably don't remember it, but a year and a half ago, she sent you a letter, and this is the letter she got back from you. It has been hanging on our refrigerator door for a year and a half. Now, it's not because we're anybody popular, but it's the impression of taking time to make a handwritten note to someone. So whether God gives you that ministry in the recesses of your own routine at home, or whether you are a shut-in and unable to get out and about, or no matter what you're capable of doing, God wants us to serve him according to his giftedness and his leading in our lives. When the Lord saves us, it renews our fellowship with the holy and righteous God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also calls us to serve him. We've heard the stats that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the church. I want to challenge you, if you are not serving in some way through this local ministry, 
God says you're saved to have fellowship with me, and until I call you home, I want you to serve me, especially through the local church. Find something that God has gifted you in. If you don't know your gifts, your spiritual gifts, talk to the leadership, your Sunday school teacher. God saves us to also serve him like this little boy did with all that he had. God wants us to serve him by what we're capable of doing. Do something that allows us to serve. Do what you can to make a difference and you will be surprised how God will use you. How to be successful in a world that is failing? Get into the word and let the word get into you. Two, have a servant's heart. Be humble to serve however God enables you. Three, do what you can to make a difference. And now four, turn with me if you would please to John chapter five. A couple of years ago I came across this passage. You know how it is, you read passages over and over again and all of a sudden you read them another time and the passage just busts off the page and the Lord uses it to grab hold of your heart and soul and show you truth there that you should have seen years ago. Well, that was one of these situations. John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there at Jerusalem, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. Verse 3. In there lay a great multitude of handicapped folk who were either blind or lame or paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water in the pool. Get the picture. Sitting around the porches. Here is the pool. Waiting for that water to be stirred. Verse 4, for an angel would go down at a certain season into the pool and stir or trouble the waters. Whoever then was first in after the troubled waters was made well and whole from whatever disease they had. Verse 5 is the verse that grabbed me. And there was a certain man who was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That's like if it happened today, he started waiting at the side of that pool in 1980. That was the year Mount St. Helen blew. That was the year that Rubik's Cube was debuting. The Dow was at a grand total of 970. The miracle on ice when the American hockey team beat Russia. Ronald Reagan was elected president and Post-its, one of my favorite things, was invented. How would you like to be waiting for something or someone to help you for 38 years? I read this passage. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe what it would be like to be there waiting for someone to help me into the water and somebody else beat me to it. And I've been waiting there for 38 years. The principle I wrote down in the margin of my Bible was this. Focus on the spiritual needs of people. For there are many who are around us all the time waiting for someone to minister to their needs. Now you read through the passage, Jesus then uh, ministers to this individual and heals him of his infirmity and he goes rejoicing. So how are we to be successful in a world that is failing? Get into the word and let the word get into you. Have a servant's heart. Do what you can to make a difference and always focus on the spiritual needs of others. And it may take dealing with the physical need to be able to open a heart to minister to someone's spiritual need. Or, as somebody once put it, let the needs of others grab our attention. How to be successful in a world that is failing? Sometimes it can be discouraging because of what's happening around us. And in the midst of us walking and being faithful to the word and faithful to serving the Lord in and through our local church and out and about in the routines of life, it can get discouraging with what's going on. At times, we can get weary with the world failing all around us. But here is our hope as believers. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. We who know the Lord is our Savior, and those who knew the Lord before they had passed away, this passage speaks to them. Verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep or those who are believers who have previously died. Those who are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who sorrow who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them who are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall be raised bodily first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. As we seek to be successful, as the Word of God lays it out through the truths as we understand them this morning and more truths that we have not had time to go through, Help us always to keep in mind that the success measured by this world is not the end. It is when we step into the presence of the Lord will they say, well done, good and faithful servant. And our hope is that one day, as believers, we will be resurrected if we die before we see that day approach. Then our bodies will be resurrected to join with our spirits and all the believers remaining will be caught up together. That is our hope that keeps us moving in the direction of measuring our life and our success, not by the world's, but by the word of God. There's a favorite song of mine. I don't know how many years I heard it, but it speaks about this passage and I'd like to share it with you as we conclude. The name of the song is The Midnight Cry. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind And it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet and Gabriel sounds the call at the midnight cry.
prophecies fulfilling and signs of the times there are Can almost hear the Father 